now I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Sabiha Basrai. I have known Sabiha for many years and mostly in a professional context. In my former life, I was an offset press operator for Inkworks Press. which is a politically progressive collective union print shop in Berkeley. And Design Action Collective spun off of Inkworks, and they would routinely bring their new members by Inkworks Press for a really, really fun tour of our press room, which is how I met Sabiha. You had a great time, right, Sabiha? Yeah, pretty much. Touring the press room? Just say yes. Um, so Sabiha has been a member of Design Action Collective for uh, 13 years now. Design Action is a worker-owned co-op, cooperative, dedicated to serving social justice movements with uh, graphic design and web development. And Sabiha is also co-coordinator of the Alliance of South Asians Taking Action, where she works with racial justice organizers to fight against Islamophobia. We need that right now. Uh, Sabiha is also a member of the Center for Political Education's advisory board, and she's a part-time faculty member in the University of San Francisco's Department of Art and Architecture. I asked Sabiha for a humorous anecdote to use as part of her introduction. She didn't get me one, so I'm going to have to just, um, well, I was going to make something up, but instead I think I'll punish her by telling a story about design action from a printer's perspective. Um, of course, at Inkworks Press, we love the designers, as we uh, affectionately called design action members. Uh, but as an operator of one of the presses they typically designed for, sometimes the jobs they sent us were, let's say, challenging. The designers were famous for painting the press sheet with ink. Their designs were horror vacui taken to its logical extreme. They put the medieval monks to shame. I always had to order extra ink whenever their jobs would roll in. But at least their designs were so busy that they hid the inevitable hickeys. And it was always so exciting to see their work on display at the protests, um, fueling political action. And another little uh, dirty secret is they always use themselves as models. So uh, see if you can spot Sabiha in the poster she's going to show you. Ah. So without further ado, I present Sabiha Basrai. Yay. Welcome, Sabiha. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I just wanted to start by honoring the fact that we are on Ohlone land. Uh, yesterday was an Indigenous Peoples uh, Day, and um, I always want to start by recognizing where we are. Um, Grendel, thank you for that intro. Uh, so I've been a real big fan of the Letterform Archive and everything that uh, these kind of spaces do to help us really hone our craft. Um, I'm going to talk today more about the political context of, of what it means to be using these tools. So when I think about my role and my responsibility as a graphic designer, as a media maker, I like to think about Paris in 1968 and the uprisings that started with, um, in st with students and with factory workers, looking at inequalities in French society, and calling attention to issues like wealth disparities and uh, calling for higher wages, uh, looking at issues of the intersections of gender and labor. And students taught themselves how to screen print. This was a new technology at the time, and they used the resources they had available to amplify their messages and really plaster the streets of Paris with these very clear, very direct political statements. Another great producer of political art is the Ospal Collective in Cuba, which was also very active in the 60s, creating these images that were sent all over the world, folded up in newspapers, uh, calling for international solidarity. So artists like Emery Douglas, who's who are creating work to this day, um, 
from the Black Panther Party is now still in our movements, still uh, mentoring young activists and artists. Uh, Design Action Collective has been in collaboration with artists locally, such as Emery Douglas and Melanie Cervantes from Dignidad Rebelde, Fabiana Rodriguez, Micah Bazant. These, we are part of an ecosystem of social justice activists who have dedicated their talents, um, their graphic design talents, to empowering our communities. But Design Action Story starts with Inkworks Press. So as um, Grendel mentioned, uh, Inkworks was founded um, over 40 years ago uh, during a time when the concept of uh, freedom of the press belongs only to those who own one really rang true. You could not get your radical socialist newspaper or your anti-war posters printed anywhere. And the fact that these uh, politically minded Marxists came together to own presses that could be available to our movements was really, really important. It was a political act. And for me, as a young designer, to see press operators who were women, who were people of color, who had agency in the way that they were running this shop was extremely inspiring. Uh, it taught me that we can model our values in the way we work with one another by organizing collectives that are democratic, that are unionized, and that have explicit political points of unity. So Design Action, as Grendel mentioned, spun out of Inkworks Press over, um, it was probably 17 years ago now, and has grown from two people to 10 people now. And we are all activists inside and outside of our office. We are all engaged in community organizing. So when we do our graphic design work, it is a collaboration with the people who are most impacted by that issue. So I also feel like our responsibility crystallizes when I think about what we're up against. We live in a time when Wells Fargo and Chevron get to pretend they are the champions of working class people of color in this country, which is bullshit. <laughs> and when um, our stories are, they are, our, our stories are co-opted and sold back to us in the form of major label clothing, or uh, Pepsi commercials. Does anybody recognize these images? Um, so these are the kinds of things that we have to look at as designers and media makers of how our actions are impacting the communities whose, whose stories these are. Whose stories are they to tell? Even when our stories are documented in Hollywood films or in high school textbooks, they are stripped of these mass movements that made them and instead simplified down into one singular figurehead, keeping with that culture of celebrity. So another way that appropriation comes up even in our own movements, um, does anybody recognize this poster? Are there any Star Wars fans here? I love this, I loved this poster. I don't know um, how many of you remember it, but it came out during the Women's March, the first big Women's March right after Trump's inauguration. And this was a kind of cultural moment too because Rogue One had just premiered, Carrie Fisher had just died. It was a real perfect kind of political moment for a graphic designer to tell this story of rebellion with these iconic images. And you know the typography is gorgeous. There is really a lot of attention to detail here. And it was really a, a point of inspiration. Um, clearly, it really resonated with so many people. And it was created in a way that, that folks could make it their own and carry it with their, you know, their own style. The problem is that this is an Asada Shakur quote. And now, there's a whole generation of young women who think Princess Leia said this. And so this was a missed opportunity. I think it was a really well-intentioned, and I, loved, I still love this poster, but it, it was a real missed opportunity for, um, for a designer to credit where this message came from and tie that moment, that political moment, that excitement to a long tradition of black struggle in this country. Asada Shakur is still in exile in Cuba. And she has 
inspired a whole new generation of young black feminist activists. Were, would the people that carried that Princess Leia poster show up for this Black Lives Matter action? This is where we can use graphic design to help tie those stories together and introduce uh, the concept of how much our struggles are interconnected. But again, it was a missed opportunity. When Design Action created the Black Lives Matter logo, we did it because we had built for years relationships with the folks that founded hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, Opal and uh, Alicia and Patrice had all been activists and organizers for years in collaboration with members of Design Action. So when this hashtag popped off, we had a trusted relationship that they could turn to and um, know that we could create something that was needed, that was timely, and that our friends at Inkworks Press would print it like overnight and make sure that these signs were up in the streets the next day and, uh, and create a free graphic that could easily be shared on social media so that there would be a, a, a signal to each other that we're part of the same thing by holding up this, this logo. And in the hands of a leaderful movement, this logo evolved. People made it their own. Chapters across the country, this one is from Vermont, uh, made their own version of it. And so we didn't have a copyright on this thing, but we created a simple mark using letter form that was easy to reproduce and easy to evolve, uh, easy to paint on a banner, uh, and a simple color palette that was versatile and continues to endure to this day uh, as other projects come out of this work. This is actually the current version of the Black Lives Ladder Matter logo that was recreated in a, by a black designer who is part of this movement. And Design Action Collective ended up designing and building the website. So it kind of all came full circle for us. Another case study I wanted to show was uh, this poster that we created when the first Muslim ban was announced. And it feels like forever ago now, but when Trump had been uh, threatening to create this executive order to ban all the Muslims from coming into the United States, we didn't know exactly what it was going to say. We didn't know exactly how it was going to be enforced. And because of my work with the Alliance of South Asians taking action, I was able to participate in a press conference at San Francisco City Hall where we were seeing these messages come together of immigrant rights organizers calling, um, calling on each other to support uh, resistance to the ban, but also to the militarized border, that we're not going to protest uh, the Muslim ban without also protesting the militarization of the southern border. And when we call for an end to the Muslim ban, we're calling for sanctuary for all people. So our refusal to let uh, our communities be divided was something that needed to be visually reinforced. And so I was literally on the phone with my coworkers back at Design Action while I was at this press conference explaining that this is the message that's coming up. and they created this image relatively quickly. And again, we're using fonts that we had handy, that we could tweak uh, in Illustrator really quickly and get this uh, put together fast. This was then printed and taken to the airports the next day. Uh, we took over the San Francisco airport and held it for over 48 hours until all the detainees there were released. The same thing happened in New York and in uh, airports across the country. And what's important to remember is even though we did lose this fight in the Supreme Court and the Muslim ban was upheld, if we hadn't taken over the airports, the Trump administration would have included green card holders in this ban. The only reason that they did not was because of this action. Because of this mobilization, they relented on the green card issue. So we'll take that as a win. Um, and because of these posters, the focus of the protests tied together immigrant communities that didn't already have a relationship and a history of organizing in this way. And it was a real invitation to broaden 
that base. And as you can see, the, so this was from day one. This is from day two at SFO. And if you look closely, you can see people brought their own versions of the no ban, no wall uh, poster. And they kind of matched the font that we used. As a, and again, this was, these are ways that we can use type to signal to each other that we are part of the same thing. We're, we have each other's back. We're here together. This image evolved for other applications too. We made, um, as the years went by, reminding each other that this fight continues. And um, on the right here is a tweet from Ilhan Omar's chair of a campaign chair. So these are th these images kind of keep coming up over and over again. So one of the things that Design Action tries to do also is make sure that the work that we do will work on press, but also work in the streets. And banner painting is still a very important part of direct action protest. So when we create uh, slogans, and when our movements come up with their kind of clear statement that they want to be the front of the march, we need to make sure it looks good, that it looks good on camera, that it's readable, and that the act of painting it can be a community organizing project in and of itself. So people who don't have a lot of experience making art or in painting letters can be invited into a process where they can learn how to do that, and it builds those relationships that allow us to be safer in the streets and stronger in our movements. Uh, this is an image of my coworker Ivy teaching a group how to screen print. And so really coming back to our roots with our um, inspiration from Paris 68. And uh, these are the tools we're still using. So when we figure out what the design is and what the shape of the letters are, we need to make sure that they can print OK, uh, especially when we don't have all of the best facilities at hand. Um, another way that we've used this, this kind of technique is to help unite um, a lot of different identities. So when Third World Resistance rolled out to uh, take over the, this was the federal building in Oakland on Martin Luther King Day, we created these placards that all had a kind of blank area and they all said for black resistance. So we could fill in the blank ourselves. Filipinos for black resistance, Palestinians for black resistance, South Asians for black resistance. And that uh, clear lettering united everybody's placard but allowed them to each have a unique story to it. So at Design Action, every piece that we create is done in collaboration with the most impacted communities. We never design in a vacuum. It's never about what do I think my personal self-expression is on this issue. It, for us, it's, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is if no one gets to see it. There needs to be a distribution plan and we need to be accountable to the people who are most affected by that issue. And if we're not, then we, will, we run the risk of making the mistake of the Princess Leia poster. So I want to close by just inviting all of you, makers of all kinds, to embrace your role as agents of the resistance. The stakes are too damn high right now for us to do anything but dedicate our work to disrupting the dominant narratives that keep our communities in such fear and if we can make sure that we're using every opportunity we have to disrupt that, then I feel like that will truly be uh, something that our industry can be proud of in this moment. So thank you. Hi, I was curious whether your group works with others overseas who have needs for signs and um, yeah, for protests and also whether, so whether you advise others on how, on these principles and also whether you've learned things from 
others overseas about what they've been doing, say in Hong Kong, for instance, and how that might affect or evolve what you guys do. Thank you. Yeah, we've, our, our direct action work is very local. Um, we do have a lot of projects that we work on with international organizations. Um, I didn't include them in this presentation, but a lot, of our, a lot of our work are things like brochures and reports and books and websites. And those are the kinds of pieces that need to, we need to consider um, different language translations, depending on who the audience is, and look at hierarchy of information so that things are clear and accessible. So those are a lot of the, the questions that come up with the more diversity of clients we have. The, the more we can kind of reflect on where, where are we getting lost in, in the beauty of something and it's not actually practical for being translated and printed in um, another country. So those are, those, are, those are probably the biggest lessons that I've learned. But um, I ha we have not had a much firsthand experience working on consulting for direct action art internationally, with a couple exceptions. We did some work around the Paris Climate Summit that was looking at just transitions and trying to empower labor organizers to tell a story about what does it look like for people in labor workers in the fossil fuel industry to be leading what the fu energy future can be and what those jobs look like. Um, so that was a really exciting opportunity and, and meant working with printers in Paris, which I had to learn about. <laughs> okay, hang on, let me jog over here. Printers in Paris, huh? Tell me more. <laughs> Who had their hand up? Thank you so much for your presentation. That was great. I had a question about, um, it seems like a lot of the projects you do are really quick turnaround mm -hmm. um, because of just the urgency of the issues. How do you balance the quality of the work and the tight turnaround times? That is a very good question. We always mat like plan for a certain percentage of our work to be rapid response because our name, Design Action, comes from direct action. That's what we were found, those are the principles we were founded on, that's, what, that's why we exist. Uh, but not all of our work is rapid response. And so we need to, we balance having capacity for that by um, making sure we also have a diversity of types of clients. So we do work for or large NGOs like Amnesty International, um, as well as these kind of direct action, one day turnaround type moments. And when we have longer timelines and budgets, then that allows us to really hone our craft. And then we just reach into our toolbox to do something that's fast. So for example, the no ban, no wall poster, like we've seen those sun rays a bunch of times everywhere, but that was what we had handy, and so and it worked. And we didn't create this t that poster to be something that necessarily needed to be super unique and stand the test of time as a very original piece. It just needed to get the job done because it again it didn't matter exactly how perfect if it was if it was late because the airport action was happening the next day. So, you know, in hindsight, when I look at it, I could see a lot of things I would fix about it. Like, that space between the S and the A, it's too big. <laughs> um, and that's, honestly, I think get doing this work for, in doing direct action work for so long has allowed me to accept that that level of perfection isn't my goal. My, per my goal is to make sure I'm making something that's useful, that's gonna win campaigns. Um, how many of your uh, clients, I guess, um, are people that have contacted you versus people that you have reached out to? Um, and I guess the second part to that question is how much influence do you have over the messaging? Um, is it mostly them who comes up with the messaging or is it do you drive that in a lot of ways? Thanks. So a almost all of our clients come through 
word of mouth and them contacting us. Um, we're really lucky to be part of a community of social justice work that ranges from the large NGOs to the, to the more grassroots groups and to have built that trust over the years so that when a project comes up, we're the team that folks will feel like they can call on. And that's that relationship building has been really important to, to all of us at Design Action, that we're investing in those long-term relationships. So it's not just a transactional vendor-client dynamic, but we're part of the same political work where maybe we're designing this thing for you today and then we're gonna be holding it with you in the streets tomorrow. And that's the relationship we wanna have. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, oh, the messaging. So that's a mix. Um, I, ever since Design Action was founded, we'd always said we wanted to be involved in the messaging strategy early on. But the reality is that oftentimes um, a project is ready for us only after an organization has gone through quite a bit of decision making. And then we just get the text and need to make it work. And we can make it work, but it's always more gratifying for us and I think more successful in general when we get to at least be in on the conversation if we're not driving that messaging strategy piece. The, the few time, there's been a few times when we've had political disagreements with our clients and that's, those are moments that I'm most proud of is when we, have, we can decide because we're a worker-owned cooperative, because we all have an ownership into how we run this business, we get to decide together if this is a client that we're going to keep, if the thing the client's asking us to do is something we're willing to do. Um, one example is there was a few years ago, there was this international women's conference that was happening in Paris. And they had hired us to create the logo for it. And it was kind of a more of a poster than a logo. That's how it goes sometimes. Um, and they wanted to feature a lot of different international women all united in this, this work. And so we had included a woman that was wearing a hijab. And one of the partner organizations in this conference did not want a hijabi in their logo. I mean, France has got a bad track record on this kind of thing. And, and, so, and that was actually right when the hijab ban in France was really getting enforced in very ugly ways. So when we got this piece of feedback, which our point person there had just copied and pasted and sent it on as an email, something that needs to change, and I lost my shit. I was so angry. And as a Muslim woman who doesn't wear hijab, I, was, I had all the feelings. And, and so we had a conversation as a team about what this meant. Are we going to walk away from this job? What are we willing to do? How much can we push back on this? What are our options? Is there a path forward? And we finally decided that, yeah, we will not make this change. If they insist on it, we will give them the files and they have to find another designer. And we were willing to kind of give up on the contract uh, in order to do that. And I felt so supported in that moment by my coworkers too, because they all agreed politically, but I was the one that was feeling most strongly having dealt with Islamophobia my whole life. And uh, that was just a really important moment for me in my career to know that I had a, a team that had my back in the way that we did this work in a principled way. So we sent that email and our uh, contact was very, very agreeable. She, was, she didn't even realize what she was asking us to do. She hadn't thought about it. And so the fact that we took a stand allowed her to go back to her team and say, listen, if you make us do this, we're gonna lose our design team. And they, they kept the hijabi in there. So um, that's, <laughs> that's, that's one, just one example of where we forced some influence, I guess. <laughs> Hi, um, I imagine in your work, uh, there is a lot of remixing, like you said, a lot of um, or even some like appropriation. Like mm -hmm. I imagine there's the potential for collateral damage. And I was wondering if, you know, there were any instances that you can tell us about and how you learned from them and 
how we can, as designers, you know, avoid collateral damage when putting out designs that are meant to be uh, very open and very use reusable. So there's some best practices around how to avoid appropriation. And for me, appropriation is about power. It's not about whether we're using similar aesthetics and points of inspiration, but it's a power dynamic. So if, um, if, I if I'm going to create something that is inspired by another artist, I would want to find a way to get consent and document that consent so that I can feel, I know where my parameters are for what's gonna feel good. So that that artist or that community that created that not only feels like they were um, respected in my process, but that they have agency in it and that they can celebrate it, that they can make it theirs too. So as much communication as possible to uh, whoever created that image that you're being inspired by. And um, if you can't, if you don't know who to ask, I think like there's always somebody to ask. If I don't have a personal connection to this particular, let's say this particular indigenous community, who do I know who works on indigenous issues? And then let me start there and go down that research path as far as I can take it. And by doing that and by getting real time feedback on the work, that will also prevent me from making cultural missteps where I may have my own blind spots because I don't know what I, what I might be missing. So I would just recommend making sure you're always asking those questions and know that we can uh, reference each other's work and our communities can be really you know, valuable uh, aesthetic tools that we can use across our, our, different, um, our different stories, but we have to have a culture of consent around it. Mm -hmm. Follow-up? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have another one. Uh, sorry, I may not have phrased my mm -hmm. question very well. I guess to make it, uh, to give an example, for example, like Black Lives Matter, um, around the time you know that started going, uh, other hashtags similar to Black Lives Matter, such as All Lives Matter, or Blue Lives Matter, which had like different objectives, different priorities came up. And so like, you know, there's a way to like ride the coattails of a design and turn it into, redirect the, the impact, the graphic or communicative impact of it to like something else. So I was wondering if like that's ever happened uh, to uh, your work and if there's a way to like avoid that. Oh, well that's a very good example of something that happened to our work, which was <laughs> the, yeah, Blue Lives Matter. That's um, the, the way that our opposition will appropriate and extract the values that the value that we're creating and turn it into something else or sell it back to us somehow that is clearly not new and it's something we should be vigilant about and, and I appreciate that sometimes we do lo lose control of our messaging and it gets taken away from us in a way that we can't use anymore without it being too fraught with other shit so um, that's where we have to just keep being really creative and really original and I do believe that the, the opposition story is trying to convince us to do all the things against our own best interest. All we have to do is present what we're doing in the most authentic and honest way possible to resonate with you know, winning over hearts and minds that turns into winning campaigns. So they have a way harder job than we do. And they ha they're getting away with it by throwing a lot more resources at it and stealing. So if we can tip the scales, we, then there's moments when we can do that and we can crack through that dominant narrative. Um, so uh, I, I don't have a way to be immune to that kind of cultural extraction. But uh, I do think if we keep an, like doing a power analysis of where we are and what we're doing and really understanding what the dominant narrative is, we can figure out where those cracks are that we can punch through and start to tell a new story. And we just have to keep doing that. Okay, let's see. We had a question over here and then I see there's like three more. But we've got time, it's all good. Do you have a written set of values, political and social values, and then 
what is the process like um, as those values evolve amongst your team and the political and social conversation changes and evolves as well? That's an awesome question. So back when Design Action was founded, we wrote political points of unity. They were actually uh, adopted from Inkworks Press and uh, they provided the framework for the, um, the baseline of what all members of Design Action Collective agree to, uh, agree with. We may have a diversity of political identities where some of us might identify as socialists or anarchists or other um, political affiliations, uh, but we all agree on this baseline um, human rights issues. Uh, we all agree that um, we are an anti-imperialist organization. We all agree that we um, believe in, a, in advocating for a world where everyone can live free and with dignity. So we've, we've, I, we have a document and it's on our website and a lot of the reasons why folks want to work with us is because we're so explicit in those um, political statements. Over the years, we've grown. Our team is more and more diverse and we've revisited those political points of unity. A few years ago, we um, added, expanded to the, um, them. We've gone through our own political education sessions to try and continue to learn and see what's missing from that document and what's missing from our own analysis. Um, I definitely, things like understanding what racism is isn't a thing that you just take one class, you read one book, and then you're not racist anymore. So it's a constant practice, and embracing that is something that the team that I'm part of, I'm really lucky to be part of a team that wants to keep investigating that. And the degree to which that turns into maybe means we need to edit our political points of unity, or uh, maybe there's some other statement that we want to share or put out or teach in that we want to help facilitate that's based on that learning that we're doing uh, is a constant process that we're in. Okay, let's see, this one. So it sounds like you have um, clients with budgets, but also you have these quick turnaround grassroots projects. So I'm wondering how you um, how you decide which quick turnaround grassroots projects to take? How do you fund them? How do you balance that so you don't go broke doing like all free work? Yeah, so, uh, so I said Design Action Collective is a worker-owned cooperative. Are folks here familiar with the co-op model? Raise your hand if you've heard of a worker-owned cooperative. Okay, like what comes to mind when you hear cooperative? Just shout it out, I can hear you. Long meetings and lots of voting. <laughs> Critical thinking, teamwork, I like that. Share and profits, exactly. Okay, so, so Design Action's model allows for the group to make those decisions together and the way that we keep the lights on is by having a sliding scale for the services that we provide. So when an organization ha is very well funded, we will charge them the top end of that scale. And we're transparent about that. So they know that they're subsidizing the Black Lives Matter work or the Justice in Palestine work or the work that's very hard to fund, either because it's so politically radical that funders don't touch it or don't know how to engage with it, or um, it's small and grassroots and hasn't built up the infrastructure yet, but it is very needed, or it's this rapid response moment where we, we have a political urgency and we don't know, uh, we don't have enough time to, to organize a budget and timeline around it and write a contract. We're just gonna make it because it's needed. And that sliding scale allows us to keep our business solvent and our margins are really thin and we definitely don't pay ourselves what is a living wage for the Bay Area which is an increasingly more expensive place to live. Uh, so it's a big challenge and we're constantly navigating that tension of uh, making sure that our services are accessible and available to the organizations that we want to serve but also paying ourselves enough to be able to 
like live healthy lives and have kids and have health care and family leave and all of those important things that are hard won by the labor movement. And so one way that we, we tried to make sure that was clear is we wrote a, a contract with our union. We're members of uh, Communication Workers of America. Uh, when Design Action was founded, we could not afford to give ourselves anything that was in our union contract. But we wrote a memorandum of understanding that said that we cannot afford to give ourselves paid vacation at this time, but we are working towards it. We cannot afford to give ourselves uh, family leave right now, but we're working towards it. And we definitely gave ourselves uh, health care right away. But there was a long list of, um, of union standards for labor that we just could not afford to give ourselves. And fast forward 17 years, we've got given a, ourselves all those things and gone above and beyond that. And that was because of our cooperative decision-making process that allowed us to slowly but surely make those important decisions on how to keep serving our movements while also taking care of ourselves. Okay, I've got a, a type nerd question. Um, so I'm wondering how much y'all weigh like historical context of um, certain design elements. So I'm thinking, for example, like Futura, which is an amazing typeface, but like the Nazi party used it quite a bit. I mean, everybody used it, but it, the Nazis used it too. Mm -hmm. uh, how important is sort of historical context of how other designs have been used? How important is that to you guys? So most of us did not go to formal art education experiences. So our knowledge of design history and typography is limited to our experience doing organizing work. And through that process, we've learned what styles and images and techniques are appropriate for different communities and different actions. And that's mostly what our guidepost is. At, and that and, and just like the practical matters of legibility and accessibility. So um, I would say really it's not, it's not present in our conversation. Uh, we've got a few type nerds in our team though. And uh, I've actually really been glad to have you know, be, be in community with the Letterform Archive to help us with those conversations because the more that we're able to understand where the font came from, uh, the context in which it was produced, the, the better we'll be able to make those decisions. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, a comment on that last question. There's a delightful book out there called Never Use Futura. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it actually gives some really nice context to where that fits into the Bauhaus mm -hmm. and the Nazis and modern advertising, so you should read, everybody has to read that book, okay. All right, but now that I have airtime, <laughs> let me ask my real question. You showed us pictures of silk screening, you showed us pictures of painting on canvas. All of these things are techniques and materials that are part of a visual vernacular that we associate with social protest posters, and I'm wondering how much you're leveraging that familiarity in, in the messaging strategy and where you decide to depart from that kind of, uh, just that kind of visual language to, to alter the message, or, or if that's even part of the conversation, I guess. I'm not sure I totally understand the question. So what, like. Silk screening, for example. So you, you brought up silk screening in 68 uh, with the, the movement in Paris. And um, so silk screening then becomes a technique that we associate with social protest posters. Um, so there's a certain kind of messaging that we get just by virtue of the materials and the techniques. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how much you're consciously ah. leveraging that in the messaging strategy or departing from that in the Thank messaging you. strategy. Thank you. That's a, that's a really interesting question. So the there's been a, a lot of times we have projects that have dual audiences. So the audience is um, a grassroots base building um, community organizing effort, but then also like a big funder or uh, a more quote unquote professional audience. And when we produce say an annual report, we wanna make sure that 
the people featured in that annual report are being featured in really responsible ways, but that the report itself looks very professional and looks serious and looks like it's from an organization that is well structured, well organized, and can uh, would be uh, not a risky thing to fund. And the the problem with that is it it plays into respectability politics around what is serious, what is professional. Um, even like thinking about the way that, the, the rules we have around what aesthetics are professional and not. Um, there's also the, the issue of if you look too slick, does it mean that you are wasting money on design and that you should be spending on providing social services or whatever your organization does? So the, those conversations come up less and less now because because printing technology has evolved to the place where four color printing isn't ex as expensive, uh, we don't have to resort to the, the most least expensive looking type pieces and there's less of a correlation between something that looks really beautifully designed and something that's authentic. It, and it depends on the audience. So that's ex those are the decisions that drive us, is who is the target audience? What, do they, what are they used to looking at? What, do they, what are the associations that they will make about certain combinations of image, texture, style, and story? And then how are we creating something that will best speak to that uh, audience and call them to take the action step that we want them to take. So sometimes it does mean making something that's got some drip marks on it because it's uh, calling people into a direct action urgent moment. And sometimes it's something that's actually, here's a report that took a year to research, here's all the charts and graphs that went into uh, explaining that data, and it looks really good, and it's printed on glossy paper, and it's for you to read at your leisure, and that's a very different aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Okay, I we had one question back here. We got two more, and maybe that'll be it for the evening. You still have a question? Yeah, okay. Thanks for your presentation. Um, they're informative. I, I grew up, at, um, when I was a teenager growing up in San Francisco, we actually had print shop, and um, th we had one class that had a linotype machine with a bucket of mold, <laughs> you know, of hot, whatever that was, iron, I, you know, some kind of metal um, <laughs> on the side of it. But also I attended a school where the Black Panther Party was passing in newspapers um, outside of it. And uh, I've had the opportunity to um, interview and videotape um, um, Emory Douglas, who I'd, I'm sure had an impact on me when I was a kid in, in, in high school. And so my question is, with the work that you're, you're, you're doing, the Black Panthers, for instance, recruited a lot of high school students, which is why they were outside of the school I attended. And I'm wondering um, how, what kind of work you find yourself doing with even younger people. I know there's a lot of college students here tonight, but with teenagers, um, is this something that they're attracted to, for instance, and that they have access to? Yes. Uh, Actually, we have a high school visi uh, class visiting us next week at Design Action. There's, there's been a, a few opportunities we've had to work with high school teachers to build into their curriculum uh, the story of, of direct action social justice art making, uh, whether it's an art class they're teaching or a history class they're teaching, a uh, media class, and uh, they're giving their students assignments that have to do with these themes of civic engagement or picking an issue area they feel strongly about. And then we get to come and either guest lecture at that class or do a workshop with them so they can help uh, develop their ideas and think about these themes of what is a strategic message if you want to talk to your peers about climate change um, or gun violence or Black Lives Matter, power, what, what are the issue that you want to work on and what are the images and messages that are going to help you do that and help uh, workshop those um, practices in, in classrooms. And sometimes those students then keep in touch with us and will come and either do internships or just uh, be mentored by us one-on-one. -on -one. And th th that's how I found my way to Design Action Collective, so I really want to pay that forward and 
uh, look at the models of the Black Panther Party of how we're still accountable to all levels of our community. Um, I wanted to ask a question uh, with regards to the fact that a lot of what you do is meant to be seen at kind of a distance or kind of in large scale or meant for um, being seen maybe in pictures or media posts. Um, are there any design considerations that you have to think about when designing to be seen and kind of like from far away um, or being shown in pictures and uh, video later on that maybe the average person designing wouldn't necessarily think about? Hmm. Yeah, we've done a fair amount of projects that have to be really camera ready. And so that has a lot to do with contrast and scale. Um, it, it also depends on where and when, uh, whether there's going to be, it's going to be light out, uh, or if it makes sense, this shouldn't be a banner, this should be a projection on a building. Uh, what else, what is it being projected on? So those just are, those are complicating factors when we're creating things that aren't getting printed on paper or aren't just going to be seen on a screen and just requires more planning. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, and honestly, I've created banners where the sun hit it from the back and then you couldn't read it because the contrast wasn't there and you know, you make a note of that and don't do that again. <laughs> okay, we had one more question here in the back somewhere, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a really big fan of the work that you do. And as an organizer, like we, and artists, like we are on the ground, right? That's how we keep up with the politics and like through meetings and campaign. So I understand that design action is not only designers and organizers or part-time organizers that work with other grassroots. There's also web developers, web designers, managers, supervisors. Like how do you keep up with the politics or do, um, political education about what's going on besides just news and using your like political identity as a base? Like how do you branch out and um, like how does the rest of the team do poli political education collectively? Yeah, so everybody at Design Action has brings their own political experience, their own identity to the group. And so I'm constantly learning from my coworkers uh, given that we have folks that grew up in other countries, who grew up from different class backgrounds, um, who have, we have a spectrum of gender, gender identities represented at Design Action. So though all of those experiences have allowed each one of us to be politicized in, in kind of different ways, but we all found ourselves to the same place, and we're all here for similar reasons, but we have a lot of discussion to have with one another. So just just by nature of us all being a really diverse group in one room helps us to not just be stagnant in a feeling like, oh, I, I understand all the things. <laughs> um, and I think that's a good reminder for any group that any of us are part of is, if, is to recognize who's missing from that group and what, what stories we're not hearing. Uh, and if you're part of a group that is um, really one dimensional as far as identities go, that's a real, missed opportunity for your work, because the work is stronger when we get to push each other uh, out of our comfort zones or the things that we feel really confident around. And yeah, I, mean, I think one, well, one thing Design Action has tried to be intentional about is to do trainings regularly. So we have the benefit of being part of a community of social justice workers who have uh, capacity and experience training a group on things like um, gender justice or uh, um, racial justice issues. We also share our physical working space with other organizations and whenever possible, we'll ask them to kind of give us a primer on what, what campaign you're working on right now. And um, we've also committed to start, we've, at, we've recently kind of kicked off a political education committee <laughs> where uh, we just work with each other to brainstorm what are reading pieces that we can do shared study around and make sure that we're doing things that can inform our work. So it is an ongoing process and, um, and you know, the fact that I get, I get to be in political spaces outside of design action, my coworkers do the same and then we can tell each other about it 
will also informs that work too. Like I get to learn about, well, what is my coworker Riley doing around supporting survivors of police violence and going to the Santa Rita jail every week? And how can I make sure that I have a stronger prison abolition frame in the work that I do with the Alliance of South Asians taking action? So design action then becomes a conduit for a lot of other work. Good evening and um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it reminds me of a lot, and the only question I was wondering is, um, I remember when I was a junior back at 2013, I was doing a summer internship called TIL, like which would, you know, youth programs, and we did a lot of social empowerment. And I remember what sort of this role reminds me of is when we did one on um, mothers against violence. So let's say for example, I met uh, the woman, the most obvious one from my district, uh, the mother of uh, Oscar Grant, and how often do you guys do like one-on-ones with that? Cause that's what we did before. Like after the presentation, like this setting, we would like talk to them, get like an in-depth understanding of their situation, their roles, how it empowers the community, how we could also work, especially me being a person of color and underrepresented communities, how it can benefit those in power, like law enforcement and such. How often do you guys do like one-on-one stuff like that? So could you clarify what you mean by one-on-ones with who? Like, uh like the hostess and like how it impacted them and like how to bring more awareness on the situation and like how it affects us as a community and them personally. Sorry, I'm still unclear about like with an organization, like. Like social empowerment, like, um, sorry, I'm just trying to think. Of no, I, I think I mean, the way that Design Action's model is, is that we don't directly do organizing work. We create art for an organizational plan. So if an organization all has a campaign, we'll work with a member of that team or, or members of that team to figure out what is their prior, what's the campaign priority, why, what is the political context for that, what is the visual landscape in which it will be seen, and then we'll develop a piece that can be a, revised in collaboration with feedback from that organization. So it's less about uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one empowerment and more about following the guidance and the leadership of the people who are most impacted by that issue and making revisions to our work based on their feedback. Oh yeah, true, we did something similar. I was, okay. I was just out of, out of curiosity, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I did, just wanted did to- Did I see one last oh. question? <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you. Um, my last question is, you talked much earlier about having fast turnaround times, um, especially for some of these uh, highly political projects that you're working on. How do you deal with feedback from the groups that you're working with when you have such a short turnaround time to get something out? How do you balance that? We don't get feedback when it's that short. <laughs> and the, the best, I think the most successful projects that do that, that support that long-term trust building I mentioned earlier are ones where we can create a piece and get feedback on it, revise it, and make sure that the people who are needing it feel heard. Uh, but then in other cases where it's very short, we have to just rely on our own instincts about what is going to be effective and make sure that we're asking the really critical questions up front and then just delivering and hoping that it's useful. And so in the case of the No Ban, No Wall poster, I was part of the organizing work around that action and planning the San Francisco airport action so I could be the one that told Design Action, this is the message. And they didn't have to worry about going and getting feedback from anyone else because I had already come directly out of that space. Uh, if we weren't sure, for example, the, the gender justice poster we did after, uh, in the wake of a, a really high profile case in India involving gang rape of a young woman, we weren't sure what message was going to be most useful for the activists and organizers who around the world who had already been working for generations around patriarchy and gender justice and we didn't want to put out a message that was going to be was going to undermine anything they were doing or oversimplify what they were doing. So we created that poster unsolicited, but we, sh we shopped it around first to get feedback before we put it out. And we just had to make a plan around how we were going to do that and execute it so we could make sure we weren't um, accidentally doing something that was harmful. 
So awesome. before I end, I just wanted to give a couple of shout outs. Um, I see my friend Brooke Anderson in the audience. Can you wait, raise your hand? Brooke is an amazing photographer. A lot of the photos in my presentation are hers. Um, and she has a lot of really amazing insights onto, into consent and photography and images, so talk to her. And then my coworker Victoria is there in the middle. Um, and my teammate Anna is here in the front. These are all people that have contributed to all the work that we do, so I just want to make sure that's shared. Thanks again. <laughs>